minutes. When are we going live? Oh no, good. All right, um, hello and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, seminar. I'm Uli Voltz, I'm a reader in economics and uh, the director of the Center for Sustainable Finance here at uh, SOAS University of London. And I'm most delighted to invite you, or to, to welcome you all to this uh, first webinar of 2021 uh, of our ongoing SOAS Economics webinar series on intensifying inequalities in, uh, and the limitations of global capitalism. And uh, so here with this webinar uh, series, we, we try to bring together different perspectives um, that will help us to better understand how inequalities uh, take root in our uh, societies and economies uh, and how they relate to uh, the crisis that we see uh, in the global economy. And uh, so uh, some of the contributions uh, uh, in this series include uh, discussions of feminist economics, racial inequalities and economic imperialism. And uh, this is uh, co-organized by the SOAS Economics Department in collaboration with the student-led Open Economics Forum, uh, the SOAS Feminist Economics Network and the Black Economist Network. And um, uh, so there will be uh, a lot of interesting uh, events coming up over the next couple of weeks. So do check out the program. Um, so today uh, I'm really delighted uh, to have with me uh, Katie uh, Catwood and uh, Gregor Ziminyuk um, to um, uh, look into a very topical issue uh, that is Harnessing finance in an age of environmental breakdown, rethinking the role of financial authorities. By now, I think everyone is well understanding that we are in a climate crisis and uh, we're now, of course, also in a pandemic. And, and um, uh, so uh, we can see firsthand how uh, problems um, related to, to sustainability or rather non-sustainable um, uh, economic developments are undermining all our well-being. And um, there has been uh, now for the last couple of years, a very intensive discussion among uh, financial authorities, monetary authorities on what they could and should be um, doing uh, to address um, climate and other sustainability problems. And um, uh, so this is kind of the backdrop against which uh, Katie will uh, give a talk. Um, Katie, uh, Katie Catwood is an economist and a policy fellow at uh, in sustainable finance at um, the Institute uh, for um, uh, Public Purpose at the uh, University College London next door. And um, so she's been uh, working a lot on issues around uh, financial governance and um, she will give us her take uh, on um, what central banks uh, and supervisors should be doing. And afterwards we'll have a, um, a comment by Gregor Ziminyuk, uh, who is a dear colleague of mine uh, at the Department of Economics uh, at SOAS. And he's also an assistant research professor at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, so Katie will talk for around 40 minutes and then uh, we'll have maybe 10, uh, maximum 15 minutes uh, comment by Gregor. And then we should have um, uh, uh, hopefully half an hour for open discussion. And uh, you are very welcome already during uh, the presentation by Katie and also uh, Gregor's intervention to uh, make comments uh, in the chat. Um, uh, we, we do record uh, this uh, event and we'll make it available 
online afterwards, so be aware of that. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Katie to deliver her presentation. And I'm um, really keen on hearing your views on this really important topic. Great to have you, Katie. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, Ulrich. Um, it's great to be here kicking off the 2021 uh, SOAS Economics webinar series. Um, so without further ado, let me kick off with my presentation. Um, there we go. So let me know if you can't see my screen there. Um, so yes, today I'm talking about the role of financial authorities um, in looking at the role of finance um, in an age of environmental breakdown. And the, the research I'm going to talk about today is very much building upon a working paper that um, I published with my co-authors Josh Ryan Collins and Ugh Chenet um, mm -hmm. last year, um, and also drawing from a previous paper that my co-authors were part of um, the year before with uh, Frank Van Leven from the New Economics Foundation. Um, so it's very much a, a group effort here in terms of rethinking the role of financial governance um, in, in these unprecedented times. And my talk today, I, I really want to um, focus around basically delivering a critique to this idea of what, what role the market should play and what role financial, financial authorities should play. I think in, in, in green finance narratives at the moment, there's a, an over-reliance arguably given to market-based mechanisms, pricing mechanisms as a means to green finance and re, uh, reorient uh, capital flows away from harmful activities and towards more sustainable activities. But I think there are a number of sort of theoretical and conceptual problems with this approach, um, which means that um, a, a far greater role may be warranted for financial authorities than is, is currently appreciated at present. So before I delve into the, the, the economics and, and the financial questions, um, I thought it's just worth reflecting upon, upon where we are, um, environmental breakdown. Um, I think the past uh, three years, four years especially, uh, the green finance movement has obviously grown enormously and has focused especially on climate change. And over the past year, of course, with COVID-19, the potentially zoonotic virus, um, you know, reaching pandemic levels, uh, biodiversity has also come onto the agenda. And, um, but I th the main point I want to make, first of all, is that we're not just dealing with climate change and biodiversity loss here. Um, environmental breakdown really encompasses multiple threats, all of which are interconnected. And I'm going to refer primarily to, to biodiversity and nature loss in, in my talk today, but I don't want to withdraw from the fact that they are obviously interconnected with all of these planetary boundaries. You may have seen this, this framework before from, from Johan Rockström, um, which is useful because it, it kind of conceptualises the, the non-linear dynamics which we're dealing with here. Each planetary process um, has a threshold or a tipping point beyond which there is a, a dramatic change in the functioning of the system. And these, these thresholds are essentially unobservable, but the delay between the initial damage and the eventual impact is such that, you know, by the time we sort of realise we're near a key ecological tipping point, especially when it's observable at the planetary process, it will be far too late. And the massive uncertainty caused by, caused by these nonlinear dynamics is, is something that I'm going to talk about quite a bit in my, in my talk today. Now, nature obviously provides um, multiple services to humankind, such as pollution and regulation of our air and water quality and resilience to natural disasters and the such. Um, and the damage and degradation of the, of the biosphere in general um, is threatening the provision of these services. But importantly, this is taking place on a much shorter time horizon uh, than climate change. So we hear quite often about the tragedy of the horizon. Um, Mark Carney obviously made that, that term very famous. I don't really think this applies to many of the uh, na nature related threats which we're dealing with today. Um, you would, would have seen reports in the news this week of catastrophic declines in insect populations. Um, that is actually already having an impact on crop production um, in the US, for example, that's been documented due to the loss of pollinators. And as I mentioned, COVID-19 um, obviously linked to uh, zoonotic disease transitions, widely suspected to be linked to it, and zoonoses are linked to land use change due to habitat loss and, and degradation, which basically greatly increases the chances of viruses to spread to human populations. So um, here we are, nature-related impacts are um, 
really up the agenda of financial um, policymakers and business leaders, especially over the past year. Because businesses are, of course, dependent on these free benefits provided by nature. The total economic value, which I've deliberately put into uh, uh, quote marks there, is estimated at about one and a half times of global GDP per year. Um, and you know, financial authorities, I think, are now seriously taking um, you know, nature loss as a material risk to both economies and financial systems. Uh, the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is a group of 75 central banks and financial supervisors, has recognised this, uh, this much, as well as the Bank for International Settlements. Um, there's a great quote there that the stability of the earth system is a prerequisite for financial and price stability, um, which I love because it kind of speaks directly to that uh, mandate excuse, which we, we so often hear from central bankers. Um, so how are these risks being conceptualized? Well, so far it's sort of very similar to, to climate change, almost a, a copy paste, you might say. Um, businesses um, are said to, well, they do, they face potentially material exposures to both nature loss um, in terms of the so-called physical risks, or more accurately, I guess you could call them biophysical risks, given they are also biotic processes, biotic processes involved. And they also face exposures to those actions intended to mitigate those losses, the tr transition risk factors. Um, and through their loans and investments to the real economy, financial institutions also are exposed to these risks. And the interaction and concentration of these risks at the financial system level may also give rise to systemic risks, which is something I'm going to talk about later. The empirical links are unfortunately under-researched, um, but the Dutch central bank has actually done some very interesting quantitative estimates of what the magnitude of these financial exposures could potentially be. And they found that 36% of Dutch financial institutions are highly or very highly dependent on at least one ecosystem service. service. And um, the linkages you can see in this very nice Sankey diagram here. But this analysis is actually likely to be an underestimation of the true impacts because it only considered first round effects. Um, and they also gave several estimations of transition risks, identifying large exposures in um, nitrogen intensive activities, for example, which is one sector which is likely to become more strongly regulated in the future. But as I said, um, further analysis is really complicated here because of just huge data gaps. Um, there's no widespread corporate reporting on the dependencies and impacts of nature, and there are methodological challenges to do with the, the complexity of the problem. So a new task force for nature-related financial disclosures, the TNFD, was launched last year and this kind of aims to solve this problem by creating a framework by which companies and financial institutions can track and, and disclose their, their nature related exposures. It's still in its planning phase um, but from what I know it sort of aims to release its voluntary guidelines in uh, 2023. And there are other disclosure and reporting initiatives out there, um, such as the proposed uh, Sustainability Standards Board uh, by the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation. Now, while of course, uh, you know, I completely acknowledge we do need more information um, in order to understand these issues. I think the key question here is there's a difference between having information to explore risks and to better understand them and relying on these kind of information based disclosure frameworks to manage risks and manage them in a way that is sufficient to safeguard the financial system. And this is where I think the mainstream green finance narrative um, is perhaps missing a trick. Um, I think, um, you know, you know, we do the, the focus on, on the provision of information and risk analysis um, as the main mechanism to green finance really has its origins in a particular branch of economics, which prioritizes the market as the most efficient mechanism to affect change. And there are theoretical um, critiques to this, which I think are important to, to, to dwell on. Um, so to delve into that, um, I'm just gonna go back into a, into a bit of theory. Um, the most prominent um, sustainable finance initiatives really conceptualize environmental problems as examples of market failures, whereby a lack of information is leading to a mispricing of risk or, or, or costs and benefits and therefore suboptimal market outcomes. And they really take the position that internalizing 
hidden environmental costs, benefits and risks is um, the mechanism by which um, market prices can then incorporate a more sustainable resource allocation and, and shift financing flows in, into the correct greener direction. And so um, many of these proponents, some of whom I've, I've quoted here in these quotes, call on policymakers, financial policy, essentially the role of financial policy, in order to create the conditions for markets to resolve this mispricing problem. So these solutions include um, the disclosure frameworks I've already talked about, um, quantitative risk modelling, and also new financial um, instruments which allow markets to set prices on where there might may be finite quantities available on available nature depletion. Um, an example of this is biodiversity offset schemes, which the European Commission are currently taking a great deal of interest in. Now, this market failure narrative is steeped in a, in a neoclassical understanding of environmental problems, which sees them as externalities. Externalities are, of course, unaccounted uh, positive or negative effects of an economic decision on another person. And the name comes from the fact that the effect in question is outside the contract of a market transaction, which brings many economists to say that in order to account for it, we need to extend, extend the realm of the market to cover the externality. Um, hence the market-based solutions I've already discussed. And the theoretical basis of this really comes from work done by the Ronald Coase in the 1960s on, on transaction costs. His theorem basically said that when transaction costs are zero and if trade in an externality is possible, private bargaining can resolve the externality into a Pareto optimal outcome, regardless of the initial allocation. Now, this is often misinterpreted as markets will generate the most efficient outcome once we have assigned property rights, i.e. we've made the externality tradable. But I think this is a misinterpretation because Coase was actually very explicit about the rigid assumptions underlying his, his theorem. You need perfect information, um, no differences in market power between the different bargaining parties, and of course, um, perfectly competitive markets, that elusive unicorn. In reality, obviously, there are costs from trying to implement property rights, such as getting information, um, the costs of negotiating collective action and designing and enforcing co contracts and institutional rules. And Coase's main point really was that market efficiency is often impeded by transaction costs. And when these are very high, efficient outcomes that may be better served by the creation of institutions, including um, government institutions. Um, and, you know, the exact choice of social arrangement really, really depends on the context. But this, this nuance is often lost in, in the market based logic of environmental problems today, and it's particularly lost within green finance debates. So I think that's that's one uh, theoretical point that's worth dwelling on. The second one is that this notion of externalities also embeds the notion of the natural world as something that is external to the economy that you know, the environment is a, another form of capital that serves as an input to production. And I think this, this ontology is, is problematic on, on two counts. Firstly, it takes a weak sustainability perspective whereby natural and man-made capital are implicitly um, seen to be essentially substitutable. And secondly, it ignores the reality that the economy is actually embedded within and entirely dependent upon the natural world. And this latter perspective is really a contribution of uh, ecological economics, which wouldn't diagnose the situation we're in as a market failure, but rather as a paradigm failure, um, you know, whereby the, the scale and the intensity of, of economic activity is, is threatening the finite carrying capacity of, of the Earth's, Earth's natural systems. And this perspective is obviously far more compatible with this idea of, of planetary boundaries that I've already discussed. So in terms of how financial policymakers are engaging with this intersection of finance and environmental issues, they very much are taking this market focused logic to heart. Uh, ooh, I've gone a bit too far ahead there. Huh. For some reason, it's not staying on my previous slide. There we are. Um, so rather than um, financial policymakers, rather than um, exploring any kind of more discretionary interventionist policy action, um, central banks so far have emphasised this need for more information for markets to account for environmental risk, with the implicit assumption that um, risk measurement will result in, in risk management, thanks to the, the efficiency of the market mechanism. 
And you know, the, the Dutch central banks, the DMB, their, their, their analysis, the conclusions they drew from that are very illustrative here. You know, despite identifying material exposures to both nature-related physical and transition risks, the conclusions that the, the Dutch supervisor came out with focused on developing these frameworks for disclosing risk and, and model it, modeling it quantitatively um, as a prerequisite to doing anything else. And the NGFS, that, that network of central banks um, I, I, I mentioned earlier, they've suggested similar priorities for, for financial policymakers in their official guidance on both climate and non-climate uh, environmental risks. However, I think there are um, a number of conceptual problems to this measurement based approach to financial policy. Ah, oh, that slide is now working. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, so the, the, I think the first question to ask is, is it possible to identify all environmental information necessary to make a meaningful estimation of financial risk? Now, the complexity of the challenges facing disclosure frameworks has already been made apparent by the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, which over three years since its launch is still not implemented by many companies and financial institutions. It's very far from being uh, a, well a widely established mainstream disclosure um, framework. Yet the fact is that nature, lo nature loss is actually far more analytically demanding than climate change. And this is even though, of course, climate change is itself a, a complex, wicked problem. The actual mechanism for, for climate change is at least something that can be delineated and measured with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So you have anthropogenic emissions, which lead to changes in atmospheric gas composition, which then lead to temperature change. And the metric for corporate reporting on emissions is actually very well established. You have this tons of CO2 equivalent metric, for example. By contrast, nature related risks present massive additional complexities due to the fact that they are multidimensional. So we have multiple different services, environmental services to society that are under threat, such as pollination and pest control, um, resilience to natural hazards that I've already mentioned. These are caused by multiple anthropogenic drivers, such as intensive agriculture, plastic pollution, deforestation. And all of these dramatic changes are taking place at multiple scales from the global to the local level. And also, as I mentioned, they're, they're already taking place over a much shorter time horizon than, than climate change as well. So the, the complex system dynamics I mentioned earlier really present manage, uh, challenges for this, this level of, of, of risk measurement. Non-linearities means that biodiversity especially is much more than just the sum of its parts. Um, the loss of keystone species, for example, can result in the collapse of entire ecosystems. And these dynamics are not precisely quantified within ecology, uh, let alone financial analysis. And then thinking about the logistics of actually putting in place a risk disclosure framework in order to quantify environmental in, uh, information, it's important to note that the measurement of these ecological impacts is actually very site specific. So if we're thinking about one firm, they're gonna be exposed to and responsible for multiple nature related threats. So within agriculture, you have, for example, pollination, uh, water scarcity, land use, soil fertility, amongst other things. And each of these threats is going to have differing in impacts um, within different local ecosystems and across different points in time. Um, so what this graphic is trying to show is that, you know, the idea of replicating such granular analysis um, up to the financial portfolio level really implies an almost insurmountable level of complexity unless you start making very broad and uh, aggregative um, abstractions. And in the process of that aggregation, there are key tail risks which may well escape identification. And then a second question to ask is, you know, even if we manage to generate a sophisticated database of information on environmental breakdown, is it possible to quantitatively generate meaningful estimates of financial risk, risk resulting from it. Now, um, financial policymakers, um, particularly central banks, recommend that financial institutions generate quantitative estimates of their um, potential exposure using risk modeling tools. Um, they've made, um, you know, 
recent admissions that historical information is obviously not going to be particularly useful in an analyzing these unprecedented threats. So they now recommend what's known as forward looking scenario analysis. Um, this is where banks basically test their balance sheet exposures against a range of plausible future scenarios, such as a best case and median case and a worst case to see what the impacts are going to be. But this raises, you know, questions in itself. Given the complexity and the multidimensionality of the problems we're dealing with, how exactly do you choose a, a, what constitutes a plausible scenario? And this actually applies equally to climate change, but I think the problem is even more acute for, for, for um, biodiversity risks and nature related risks. Because scenario analysis requires that you take some sort of view on the, the probable pathway for economic transition. Um, with climate change, um, the proxy is uh, that is taken as often a carbon price, um, but there's no equivalent for nature loss. Um, resolving, you know, the various impacts of, of various environmental threats uh, actually involves very deeply political questions, um, institutional reform, policy reform, regulatory reform at, at various levels from, from local to global. So selecting some scenarios to reflect such uncertain futures is obviously going to be highly subjective. And I, I would argue it's akin to crystal ball gazing, to be honest. Um, and the, the reason for this comes back down to the um, dynamics of, of system complexity. Even if you have all of the initial inputs to a complex system, you cannot deterministically estimate its future outcomes because it requires you to take a view on you know, potential behaviours and interactions of, of multiple different variables. And this really comes back to the ontology of human environment interactions um, that I mentioned earlier. Ecological systems, socioeconomic systems and financial systems um, should be more commonly appreciated as telecoupled complex adaptive systems, which means they're interconnected through flows of energy and matter, but also information and finance um, across space and time. And the way that the effects of the pandemic, for example, have cascaded across highly interconnected global supply chains and the global financial system is really um, testament to this complexity. And, you know, I don't think anybody would claim to have been able to quantitatively estimate either the timing or the precise magnitude of, of the economic consequences that have resulted from the pandemic. Um, you know, and an another point to, to mention is, and this has been written about extensively elsewhere, that the scenario models favoured by financial policymakers are still relying on these integrated assessment models, IAMs, which have a number of constraining assumptions in, in, in and of themselves, such as rational expectations and efficient markets. Um, one of, you know, the most notable one is that they often abstract away from financial markets altogether, which is an interesting analytical decision um, in the choice of tools to assess financial stability, I think. So for all of these reasons, you know, we make the argument that policymakers need to move away from quantifying environmental threats as probabilistic risks and, and instead appreciate them as situations of radical uncertainty. This is um, a distinction first made by Frank Knight in the 1920s and also um, highlighted by Keynes quite a lot in his work. And it basically emphasizes that in the absence of historical trends or, or known probability functions, um, the precise timing and magnitude of future outcomes cannot be meaningfully estimated. This is obviously especially the case for environmental breakdown, both the biophysical threats and also the socioeconomic structural transition implied are completely unprecedented. So the idea of, of rational expectations, um, I think it, it is not, not entirely suitable. I think rather uncertainty is a much more useful concept to, to centre ourselves around. And this also undermines the, the market failure type understanding that we saw earlier and the reliance on generating more information for markets to price in. The fact is that there are substantial unknown unknowns and the relevant information may never be known to, to markets until it's far too late. And central banks have actually acknowledged the limitations of scenario modelling under these uh, conditions of uncertainty. However, their, their favoured solution to this conundrum is sort of to call for more research on, on different types of quantitative methodologies that might better account for these dynamics. And um, of course, you know, whilst the move towards heterodox approaches is, is always welcome, I think given the urgency of the threat, um, that alone is an insufficient course of action.
So one, one final shortcoming of the approach taken by financial policymakers so far is also that it takes um, arguably a very one-sided view of the interactions between finance and the environment. As I noted earlier, this notion that sustainability issues poses risks to companies and financial institutions is quite widely established, this risk exposure channel. But um, less acknowledged is the other side of the equation, the fact that companies also generate impacts that contribute to sustainability issues. Um, this concept of double materiality has been emphasised by the EU Commission with regard to corporate financial reporting, but it's not yet widely spoken about at a green finance level, despite the fact that exactly the same concept, of course, applies to financial institutions. Not only are they exposed to nature related risks from the businesses that they finance, uh, but on the flip side, through those very same loans and investments, um, financial institutions actually facilitate the business activities that give rise to these impacts. So in this way, there is a, a financed impacts channel. And a typical response given by central bankers might be that they are only interested in risks to the system in line with their narrow mandates to protect price and financial stability. But here I think there's a critical underappreciation of the role played by the financial sector in actively generating and potentially propagating such risks. And the concept of endogeneity uh, I think is really crucial here. Endogenous risks are those risks that emerge from within our and are amplified by the, the financial system itself. So by financing harmful activities connected to negative environmental impacts, financial institutions may in fact be giving rise to future um, financial materiality. Firstly, through the creation of um, transition risks, the fact that the, these harmful activities may become more strongly regulated in the near future. Um, and secondly, through future biophysical risks that will arise from, from those negative environmental impacts. So rather than it being a one way street, um, the transmission of nature related threat to financial risk should be more appreciated as a series of feedback loops. But the important takeaway here, I think, is that finance cannot continue to be seen as this passive intermediary um, by facilitating anthropogenic drivers of nature loss. Um, private financial flows are actively undermining um, the intentions of broader government policy with regards to the ecological transition. And there is um, growing empirical evidence of this, this financed impacts channel. Um, so the, the Dutch central bank uh, calculated that the financing practices of Dutch financial institutions contributed to over 58,000 square kilometres of habitat loss. Um, elsewhere, there's analysis by a consultancy, Profondos, found that the world's largest banks provided more than $2.6 trillion financing linked to the destruction of ecosystems in 2019, which is more than the GDP of Canada. So taken together, um, these three points I've just outlined, you know, I'm trying to explain why we can't rely just on markets to price in risks efficiently themselves. Firstly, the, the relevant information may never be known because of the fact there are unknown unknowns involved. Secondly, quantitative risk models have inherent limitations when dealing with radical uncertainty. And finally, you know, financial markets themselves can't be assumed to be efficient. You know, they're prone to irrational speculative behaviour. Um, they play an active role um, in facilitating some of these negative impacts through their financing activities, all of which suggests that there's a need for some sort of policy oversight and intervention that goes beyond just uh, supporting new frameworks for risk disclosure and modelling. So the greater role for financial authorities. Um, so my rationale here is, is, is threefold. Um, firstly, there, there's a risk argument, which I think is well understood, um, given that environmental breakdown is obviously um, widely acknowledged to pose risks to price and financial stability. Um, so I think that argumentation is, is already within central banks mandate. Um, secondly, there's an argument for a need for policy coherence. Um, financial policy needs to ensure that private financial flows are supporting or at the very least not undermining broader government policy. 
And this sort of mandate is implicitly included within some advanced economy central banks, such as the ECB, which has a secondary mandate to support the union's um, economic objectives. And thirdly, there's this question of the mobilization of finance, which itself is, is also two-sided. On the one hand, we need more finance flowing towards activities which are compatible with the ecological transition, um, whilst at the same time flowing away from, from the harmful activities exacerbating the problem. So given the failure of markets to ensure um, these things are happening at present, um, you know, we argue that a far greater role by public financial institutions is warranted and central banks should be one part of a broader ecosystem of public financial actors, which should also include national investment banks that can affect change in this area. So the case for immediate policy intervention um, is also supported by the precautionary principle. This is um, well established in the, in the legal sphere, um, which recommends the use of preventative policies to protect human health and environmental health under situations of scientific uncertainty, uh, where there is threat of serious threat of, of ir irreversible damage. And this also acts as a counterpoint to those government failure arguments, um, because it insists on not postponing action uh, in the case of climate change and environmental breakdown. Of course, the costs and risks of inaction escalate uh, the longer that mitigating action is delayed. So that hence the justification to take a risk averse policy stance in the face of uncertainty. So what does this look like for financial policy? Well, we're saying that instead of asking for new research in the face of a threat, which is the approach of some central banks at the moment, um, we're saying that certain policy de decisions can be taken based on the science that is widely agreed upon already. So um, my co-authors, Josh Ryan Collins and Oog, um, along with Frank from NEF, um, you know, they've articulated what they call a, a precautionary financial policy approach as an alternative to the current risk measurement approach. And this involves, firstly, a move to complement quantitative analysis with more qualitative means of understanding and managing environmental risks. Secondly, a shift in the, in the purpose and the mindset of policymaking from market fixing to market shaping, uh, which involves you know, the, the co-creation of new markets um, with other public and, and private actors, um, new markets that are compatible with the ecological transition. And thirdly, and I'll touch on this point briefly in the conclusion, um, the need for increased coordination across different parts of the financial policy ecosystem, so more fiscal, monetary, prudential policy um, uh, coordination. I'm going to tackle these first two points in turn and, and sort of illustrate how they could be applied to the problem of nature related risks. So firstly, dealing with uncertainty using qualitative approaches. Um, now, our argument is where there's little doubt to, as to the potential magnitude speed or direction of a harmful trend, um, you know, fixating on precise quantitative results is not necessarily going to improve insights for decision makers and at, at the worst it can actually distract from the best course of action. Um, so instead of replying on, relying on, on complex modelling, we're talking about using rules of thumb, um, general direction setting, uh, learning by doing, and, and none of this is alien to financial policymakers, actually, um, as these quotes here show, uh, since the financial crisis, regulators have acknowledged that systemic risks can't be precisely measured through tools like scenario analysis. And they actually now make use of relatively simple indicators such as credit to GDP ratio, ratios and you know, other um, measures such as the uh, non-financial indicators such as bank size and interconnectedness in order to make decisions on how to implement macro prudential policy. Oh, sorry, I really skipped ahead there. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and the second point is, um, you know, how to rethink the purpose of financial policy um, in order to shape markets. And the key insight here is learning to work with system complexity. So, um, you know, the precautionary financial policy approach takes the position that financial policymakers are not exogenous to the financial system, you know, like a weather forecaster would be to the climate, for example. Rather, they are active market participants and the interventions they make uh, feedback and influence market outcomes. 
And there's a recent body of literature examining how policies can be designed to harness complex system behavior in order to accelerate this kind of transformative system change. And the idea is you focus interventions on sensitive intervention points in order to trigger uh, desirable feedback loops and, and positive spillover effects in your advantage. And an example of where this has worked has been in, in the global coal industry, for example, where changing tax and subsidy policy has really tipped the costs of new coal power plants over the threshold compared to their uh, renewable counterparts in, in most major markets. And these ideas should be highly relevant to financial authorities, actually, given that complex threshold behaviour exists in both, in both ecological and, and financial systems. And for nature related risks, an obvious point to target would be those flows of finance that are going towards the harmful corporate activities. Now, a common critique um, of this sort of discretionary intervention is that they could have unintended consequences. Um, in the case of central banks, it's often argued that there's a trade off between physical and transition risks. And that means that policies to tackle the former could end up crystallizing uh, short term transition risks. But actually, here, I think the concern is misconstrued. Given that, that financial authorities are part of the system, they're not exogenous to it, interventions can and should be designed and deployed to minimise these potential market dislocations by proactively encouraging actors towards an orderly ecological transition. So, you know, just as central banks already use monetary policy, their monetary policy signalling power um, with forward guidance, um, you know, clear timely communication to markets could signal the introduction and phase tightening of um, environmental interventions. Now, this market shaping role obviously goes beyond the core mandates of central banks at present, which is where the concept of policy coordination becomes more important, and I will reflect upon that shortly. So what does a precautionary approach look like in practice? Um, well, in our paper, we articulate one policy approach that central banks and financial supervisors could use to account for the risks of financing, financing nature, nature depleting activities. And the idea is that um, they draw up uh, what we term an exclusionary list of harmful activities, you know, uh, in collaboration with relevant government ministries, for example. And these activities, um, the list would be, you know, where there is clear scientific consensus that they are causing negative impacts, such as tropical deforestation, for example. And this list then determines eligibility within the central banking toolkit. Monetary policy operations, which obviously um, have uh, key effects on, on market prices, can exclude assets that are linked to such activities, whilst prudential regulation can be used to discourage financial institutions from financing firms undertaking these excluded practices. And a clear advantage, I think, of this approach is that by targeting those harmful flows, it's directly addressing potential sources of endogeneity within the system itself. So this table shows the sorts of activities that could be included in an exclusionary list. Um, and it's worth saying there's actually considerable precedent for this kind of approach. Um, private banks already define um, the sorts of activities and practices that they won't finance as part of voluntary sector specific lending and investment criteria. Now, in practice, uh, these are often inconsistent across firms and there's little incentive to conduct robust due diligence procedures. So many of the banks linked to the um, deforestation in the Profundo analysis I, I said earlier, uh, for example, they did already have deforestation policies in place. They clearly weren't particularly effective. And there's also um, precedent within um, financial authorities too. So the Brazilian central bank has restricted rural credit in the Amazon to firms that have stuck to environmental regulations. And there's been some subsequent econometric analysis that has shown that the policy has resulted in uh, material reduction. And more recently, of course, the SMB has announced it would exclude coal mining investment portfolios. Now, the NGFS in, in its uh, latest guidance has opened the door to this sort of exclusionary approach. Um, it noted in its prudential guidance published last year that um, supervisors could prohibit certain financial institutions from carrying out certain activities um, where the level of risk is deemed too high. Um, this guidance is actually given from a micro 
prudential um, perspective. But you know, given the systemic and endogenous nature of these risks, there's a strong argument to extend this guidance to system-wide exclusion criteria. So just some, some final reflections. I think some of the points I've raised during my talk are going to um, clash directly with current debates out there at the moment on this concept of market neutrality, which is still one of the guiding principles of financial policy within advanced economies. But I think the point I wanted to make is that once we recognise that the market is not generating the desired outcomes with regard to environmental breakdown and its intersection with the financial system, the justification for clinging to such a principle, which, you know, in any case was not particularly strongly adhered to, um, breaks down quite dramatically. And indeed, Christine Lagarde has, has obviously come out um, also questioning this concept of market neutrality recently. And um, as has the ECB's legal research agenda this year, which will be um, also tackling the question of market neutrality. So some interesting developments, I think, that are going to happen um, over the course of this year. And it's our hope that a precautionary financial policy approach could become one of the alternate paradigms that, that justifies financial policy making under particular conditions, in this case, the conditions of radical uncertainty. But the, the discretionary approaches I've also touched upon here do raise questions as to the role of financial authorities in the future. And, you know, I recognise there's a dilemma here. Uh, monetary policy and financial policy cannot and should not be solely responsible for resolving environmental breakdown. That's obviously highly unrealistic and, and well beyond their mandates. However, you know, waiting for the government to take the lead on action risks them failing to deliver on their, their core mandates of price and financial stability. And also failing to act on these endogenous dynamics within the financial system risks undermining broader government policy on the transition. So, you know, to that end, we, we argue that further work is really needed on what sorts of coordination can, can be levied between different financial policymakers, in particular between fiscal and monetary and prudential policy, in order to address these dilemmas. And to give central banks the, the legitimacy to continue supporting broader government policy. And, um, you know, as I'm well aware, this coincides with the broader debate about the role of, of central banks within society. Um, and, you know, as the pandemic response has made abundantly clear, um, central banks are powerful public financial institutions and they have an array of tools at their disposal to, to support government objectives. And I think there's going to be a lot more um, research digging into these questions over the course of this year. And I look forward to chatting more about those questions in the discussion. So that's it from me. Thank you very much, Katie. I'd be very tempted to, to give a, an immediate response, but uh, I will hold back. And I would like to invite Gregor to deliver his uh, comments. And Gregor, if you could perhaps try to limit yourself to 10 minutes so that we have around half an hour left uh, for Q&A at the end. And again, um, you're all welcome to, ah, oh, there's a uh, first uh, question coming in the chat from Yanis. Uh, so you're all encouraged to, to put your um, uh, comments and questions in the chat. Uh, Gregor, over to you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, for this presentation, which um, went beyond a lot of the discussion about um, these physical and transition risks that are often dominated by the problem of climate change, and as you also document in your writing, you know, some of the climate change mitigation measures may actually exacerbate some of the other nature related risks. So I think it's, it's really excellent that you are trying to look at this broader uh, problem of uh, nature related financial risks. And yeah, um, and have given a critique of the current approach of financial regulators to, to dealing with these essentially via the attempt to measure this risk actively and then hope that market participants will act on it in accordance with um, um, well-functioning financial markets that price in all information. Um, I'm just going to give a few comments here and there. And the first one relates directly to this, um, to this information and pricing and how we are thinking about it. And I hope that this may somehow add something to the subsequent discussion. Um, but uh, you brought the, the idea of market failures into play uh, 
um, which of course is kind of a, a, a well-fitting term if, if the market doesn't process the information, it fails. But um, I think it's, it's useful to think this through with some nuance. Uh, you also mentioned cause and, and externalities. And I think here we're kind of dealing with two different but related uh, types of failures, um, if, if I'm following you well. So on the one hand, we have these um, non-priced in uh, externalities that are somehow imposing a cost on society, but they do not um, impose a cost on the participants directly involved. So the, the original story, not the original, but the famous stories with the upstream factory that pours some, um, some pollutants into a river and then society, quote unquote, downstream is, is, is being harmed. And, and you know, Pigou said that that could be taxed away and then Coase kind of critiqued that uh, approach and uh, many people misinterpreted him as you, as you say. Um, but Mike, but it seems to me from what you are saying is that some of these risks are already uh, owned. So there are property rights, people, so, and, and, and Coase of course says, if we assign property rights, then um, in principle, uh, we could deal with these um, externalities and, and find good prices between the parties involved. And so, um, it seems to me the debate here is about risks that are already owned. So somebody's having a loss who owns these, these assets, for instance, um, or um, extends loans to the companies um, that are somehow exposed to these risks, but they just don't know about it. Um, so that seems to be a little bit different from this um, classical Pigou Coase story about, you know, we have to make a market for carbon emissions, for instance, and then trade the, the, the permits or, or tax carbon because it's not owned, the, the risk. But here it is. They actually all own it. They just don't, don't know it. Um, so I think that's interesting. And it goes more into these, uh, which you also uh, discussed, the, the incomplete and asymmetric information problems, which then lead, lend themselves to kind of the principal agent uh, situation. And I think it would be interesting to and, and some adverse selections possibly. And it would be interesting to, to think through who's the principal and who's the agent here. It seems to me that the financial firms are really the agents that are doing poor investments and uh, the, the, the owners uh, and, and society is the, the principal in some sense. Um, but, but these are just some comments on this problem of market failure, which um, I think is, is a very useful lens, but also, um, there, there are some nuances there um, that at least I'm, I'm grappling with now, uh, <laughs> um, not thinking about this um, all the time. Um, now, a second comment relates to uh, the bigger picture. Um, you know, a lot of discussions, how to deal with these uh, nature related problems uh, for human societies, uh, you know, think about the green growth or degrowth. They're sort of the two big uh, yes, no dichotomy things, but there are of course many pathways within these. And I'm wondering to what extent, um, you know, in what kind of world uh, these central banks are talking about, um, you know, mitigating these risks via risk disclosure, or also you are discussing some of the alternatives. Is it a green growth world, which, um, you know, or, or is, it a, is it a world that really changes how things are, uh, how, how people conduct their business? Um, because I would think that this puts important constraints on, you know, how much risk you can mitigate just by, I mean, you know, if, if society engages in certain activities because it wants to keep growing, for instance, I mean, isn't there someone who really, is going to be affected by this anyway, or, or, or can this just somehow be magicked away with, with I mean, all the risks with, with if not um, identifying risks, then somehow taking these prudent actions. And that's also related to a third comment um, you brought up IAMs, the integrated assessment models, which are of course very prominent in the business of sketching these uh, future worlds. Um, based on um, now in the IPCC on these shared social 
uh, economic pathways. And most of these tend to be kind of green growth types um, with um, optimistic growth projections by and large. But I did want to defend these IAMs a little bit. Um, first of all, not all of them have rational expectations. There are quite a few that are just myopic um, uh, period by period um, constraint optimization um, models. And there are even so-called heterodox uh, <laughs> approaches, for instance, E3ME uh, in Cambridge is, uh, is a demand-driven macroeconometric model that works completely without any um, um, you know, agents optimizing this or that. And, and full disclosure, I'm working with the modeling team, so I may be biased, but they, you know, uh, and, and I, I'm wondering furthermore, um, if, if that's really, if they have to somehow be able to um, sketch these financial downside risks, don't they rather paint a picture, um, you know, a, a canvas on which uh, financial actors could actually think about what sort of risks would arise for them? So aren't these models more in the business of sketching potential, you know, real worlds with real nature losses um, that then you know, the financial community somehow has to grapple with. And um, right, that leads me to uh, almost my last point, which is a bit um, controversial perhaps, but um, you know, a lot of these problems are already really um, dire today. Um, not, I mean, you, you showed the Rockström paper, the first one I think was published in 2009 and the nitrogen cycle was already beyond all bounds. But um, I mean, financial markets, as far as I can see, have done really well in the last 10 years. Um, so like, uh, I, I think I would like to understand a little bit more um, like everybody else, I guess, and it's hard to do this because we don't have the data and the information, but you know, to what extent are financial market actors actually justified in, in having sanguine expectations about future, you know, large corporate performance, large bank performance at the center of, of capitalist um, economies. Um, because these firms will continue to, to have markets to sell to the top so and so many percent of earners in the world, largely concentrated in a few countries. And the, you know, the people at the bottom of the pyramid who are living in the areas that become increasingly uninhabitable, that dry out, those are the ones that take the brunt of, of the losses, but they don't really, you know, maybe the financial system is quite well insulated against those shocks. Um, so um, it brings me back to my initial point and I close, I'll see Uli um, popping up there, uh, sternly <laughs> looking at me, I think. Um, that you know, uh, to what extent is this an externality in the in the Pigouvian sense? Um, the financial sector perhaps benefits from the activities it's doing and its shareholders, but uh, the society at large is actually the one that is um, at risk. So, kind of, um, you know, meta comments on some of the very detailed, interesting um, uh, knowledge that you've shared with us, and I hope it stimulates discussion. Thank you very much, Gregor, also for, for being good on time. Um, and uh, glad if, if my, my, my view, uh, my appearance uh, helped that. Um, so we, we have a couple of questions already in the chat and I also have some, some questions, but um, I'd first like to invite Katie to, to give a brief response to uh, Gregor's uh, feedback. Uh, but if you could really try to do that in like, you know, just a few minutes because uh, I'm keen to bring in others. Sure, and thank you so much for your um, considered response, Gregor. Um, you raised some really interesting questions there. I think I'll, I'll start off on your third point on um, integrated assessment models and, and the use of models in general. Um, you're completely right, there are some great um, heterodox approaches out there emerging, and um, it's especially great to see that financial authorities are taking more of an interest in using some of these more novel methodologies. Um, I think the point I was trying to make, um, and perhaps I didn't say this very clearly, I'm not trying to write off the use of quantitative analysis. Uh, quantitative analysis is really important in order to explore 
uh, future scenarios to understand them better. Um, what I take issue with is when uh, financial authorities and policymakers in particular are leaning on the results coming from these models as a prerequisite in order to take any further intervention. And that's how I think they're being used at the moment, sort of as a shield um, to shield them from these, these difficult questions, which I think need to be taken more urgently. So that's what I would I would say on models. Um, on your second question on um, you know green growth versus degrowth, where are financial policymakers on the spectrum? Um, I think it's a good question. I think I'm not sure I can give a fully comprehensive answer to that, but my initial thoughts I would be they are um, not really considering um, the implications of this question in their scenario modelling at the moment. Um, the NGFS published their, their guide to climate scenarios last year, and um, those scenarios all assumed you know, pathways for economic growth. Um, under all of the, the re representative scenarios. And they also had some quite problematic assumptions embedded within them in terms of assuming quite dramatic rates of decoupling um, between growth and, and CO2 emissions, which is obviously um, an assumption that's highly contested by, by ecological economics. So I would suspect, um, I, I don't get the impression it's an issue they're engaging with actively or at least openly, but I suspect they're leaning more towards the, the green growth side of the spectrum there. And um, on your, your first question on, on global public goods and, and externalities and where property rights are being assigned, I'm not sure I, I sort of fully grasped your question there, um, but I think the an interesting point to make in terms of who owns these property rights, are they being assigned? What, what I would say is, you know, actually we're, we're dealing what are essentially a series of overlapping public goods um, from various scales, from local scales to global scales. So I don't think the property rights are particularly um, defined at the moment. And I think just because you have exposure to an asset which is potentially impacting a nature-related threat, I don't think that necessarily means you have uh, property rights over, over that threat, over who it impacts, for example. Um, and th this is just na this is a, a result of the the mobile nature of some of the threats we're dealing with. If you're talking about pollution, your your example gave upstream uh, and downstream parties to a to a pollution problem. Well, I think you know a lot of environmental breakdown is, is this writ large, right? You have um, uh, the the the, the, the de delineation of who is affected. By a threat is very often very separated from where the source of that that impact has come from and i think this is where um new financial instruments have really been touted as a potential solution to this issue um i mentioned biodiversity offsetting very briefly in my presentation i had wanted to go into it in a lot more detail but it was sort of uh, constrained on on time but these new financial instruments are really trying to create these new markets create property rights um where they where they don't exist at the moment and actually, um, you know, I would say they, they suffer from a lot of agency problems like you, like you mentioned, such as asymmetric, asymmetric access to information between regulators and developers and um, very few incentives to, to correctly estimate the potential risks and benefits. So I think these instruments, we also need to be raising um, critical questions out as well. But um, yeah, I'll leave it there and I'll um, hand over back to you Ulrich for the, for the Q&A. Uh, thanks, Katie. And, and uh, so we have quite a number of questions uh, piling up already. So before I, I, I give my own views, I'll uh, pick up some of those. So from Yanis Dafemos, who's also uh, a colleague at the Economics Department here at SOAS. Um, what do you think are the key implications of the precautionary principle for one, the links between climate finance and climate justice? And second, the question of whether financial and monetary policy should be re uh, should reflect physical risks. Okay, um, implications for the precautionary principle on climate finance and climate justice. This is an interesting one. To be honest, I think it, it really takes the question more into the legal sphere rather than e the economic sphere. Um, the way um, my co-authors and I have sort of conceptualized the precautionary principle is as a, an alternate paradigm to justify policy making under conditions of certainty, uh, sorry, radical uncertainty. 
Um, so extending that to um, notions of justice, particularly from a financial policy angle, I think is um, going beyond um, where our initial analysis has taken it. But I think it, it, it's an interesting um, uh, direction to, to look at for sure. And on the, the question on, on physical risks, I'm not sure I fully understand um, what you're getting at there. Maybe, Anis, if you just jump in <laughs> and explain. And maybe if I can just give give one thought on on, on this justice aspect because that's something yeah. I've been uh, thinking about quite a bit and also doing some stuff. So um, what what our research has shown is that clearly um, climate vulnerability is um, having a disproportionate effect on um, uh, the poorer bottoms of society, and um, so. Uh, trying to, to address this justice in, uh, injustice inherent to, to climate change, I think is a really important aspect. And uh, it is also contributing arguably to, to um, uh, microeconomic instability. Um, so I think that there is kind of the, the, the justice aspect, but uh, there is also, again, uh, the financial, micro financial stability uh, aspect that I, I think needs to be addressed. So I think there are uh, two different rationales why, why financial government should be concerned with that. Uh, and we actually had a comment uh, by uh, Myung Seop, sorry for um, wrong pronunciation, uh, who also pointed to the um, uh, uh, financial inclusion uh, dimension, um, kind of uh, saying that this is not, not sufficiently uh, addressed in the discourse. And I, I'm just gonna, gonna put a, linked to a recent uh, report that we published uh, at the Center for Sustainable Finance uh, together with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion on uh, this uh, topic of inclusive green finance, where we make the link between um, uh, green finance and, and uh, financial inclusion and, and how uh, exactly um, uh, the bottom of society is disproportionately affected and, and how we need to mobilize uh, finance in a way that it helps uh, uh, a just transition. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. But um, uh, this just add a, add a side remark. Um, so there was um, a question from um, Q, sorry, I'm not good with uh, reading out names. Um, uh, Q, uh, Q Dan Yin, sorry, completely wrong pronunciation, but um, how do you personally see central bankers' own scruples about taking up a more active role in the fight against the climate crisis, e.g. Bundesbank President Weidmann's critical remarks on ECB greening its QE? This is a, a great question. Um, it really sort of captures the, the crux of the debate we're at, at the moment, I think, in terms of the role of, of central banks in society and vis-a-vis um, -vis their mandates and, and broader government policy. In terms of, of President Weidman from, from the Bundesbank, um, you know, from what I remember, his, his critical remarks have really centered on a very narrow interpretation of what the ECB's mandate is in terms of price and financial stability. And he leaned very heavily on this market neutrality argument that I mentioned, the fact that um, central banks uh, in their policies should try not to um, create further distortions in market prices by you know, favoring certain sectors or or not favoring other sectors. And like I said, you know, my position on this really is that market neutrality is not a policy that's ever really been adhered to by central banks. Um, they have a history of favoring um, certain sectors in their policies. Um, so, you know, just to take the most recent responses to the, the pandemic, for example, the Federal Reserve has been empowered to act as essentially investor of last resort to a number of financial markets, including junk bonds, um, ETF funds, um, various corporate bonds. And of course you have the, um, in the, the Bank of England and the ECB also have very active, very large corporate bond purchase schemes, which are not market neutral. You know, they explicitly do not in um, buy financial institutions, for example. That is uh, not a, a market neutral decision, it's a conscious decision. And the, you know, the ECB's um, asset bond purchase program also has explicitly favoured um, that industry in order to shore it up in the, in the aftermath of 
of a difficult period in, in the capital markets after the previous crisis. So, you know, my position on this is that, um, you know, President Weidman, for example, is really taking an unrealistic, um, he's unrealistically optimistic in terms of how market neutrality is being implemented at the moment. And we need to, the, the challenge now is, if we recognise market neutrality is no longer a, a functioning guiding principle for central banks, we need to find alternate paradigms in order to replace them, uh, given the nature of the threats we now face today. And the argument you know, we're making in our paper is that a precautionary approach is one such paradigm that could be applied um, to the particular challenges faced by environmental breakdown, uh, for example. So that would be my take on that. If I may add, in, in the context of um, uh, market neutrality and central banking and climate change, I always like to bring up um, a quote from uh, Lord Stern, uh, who uh, very appropriately described climate change as the greatest market failure ever. Uh, and um, by adhering to some supposed market neutrality, uh, I would say central banks are basically perpetuating that market failure. But um, I, I would also agree with you, Katie, that more broadly speaking, uh, the very notion that uh, central bank policy can be market neutral, I think is, is a big fallacy. Um, every interest rate decision uh, has huge distributional implications. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, but, but I think, uh, I mean, it, I remember the discussion we've had a couple of years ago um, and, and uh, it has changed completely. I mean, the, the uh, having a very senior central bankers, um, and that actually includes Jens Weidmann, um, admitting that uh, market failure, uh, uh, sorry, that, that um, um, uh, market, uh, uh, central banking is not uh, always market, central bank is not always market neutral. Um, is a big step, and of course now now the question is how 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 are we going forward? Um, but uh, I do sense a big shift in the discussion. Um, there was a um, it was more comment than a question, I think, from from Patrick Flynn, um, who wrote, "My take uh, on this is that the financial institutions are taking leadership towards establishing this disclosure framework, and the corporate incentive is to be transparent." about a climate risk related book and get your credit rating price fairly as a result. Uh, but uh, is there a, disc a disincentive for non-transparency compliance question mark? Um, yeah, this is a really interesting question actually. Um, I think there's several ways you can look at it. Um, firstly, I think, um, well, let, let, I think firstly, it's interesting to see what kind of people are actually making use of the climate disclosures that are being um, put out there at the moment. Um, Daniel Clear, who's the um, head of sustainability at HSBC Bank, uh, was quoted making an interesting point that, you know, he can count on one hand the number of times institutional investors have asked him about HSBC's TCFD disclosures. Um, which I think, you know, is a really fascinating insight, you know, spending all of this time and effort getting companies to disclose this information and investors aren't necessarily looking at it. And personally, I think this comes down to um, limitations of, um, you know, the cognitive capacity of, of markets to fully account for all of this information, especially when it's sort of buried in, in corporate sustainability uh, reporting booklets and is not um, being laid out um, necessarily in, in the most obvious fashion. But in terms of disincentives for not being honest in, in your reporting, um, I think there's an, there's a, there's an interesting, interesting incentive problem um, with regards to the regulator here because um, at the moment, um, central banks and financial supervisors are encouraging uh, banks to disclose their risks, but at the same time saying that there's not going to be any uh, regulatory consequences for those disclosures. Um, this, for example, came out in the Bank of England's biannual um, climate scenario consultation, which um, is a, a great supervisory exercise they're actually going to launch later this year. 
But this kind of raises really critical questions, I think. Um, you know, okay, the Bank of England is saying your um, disclosures are not going to be, they're not going to have regulatory consequences at the moment, but the fact the supervisor is asking for them means they may do at some point. Um, so what really is your insensitive, incentive as a finan financial institution to make a conservative estimation of your potential exposure? And by conservative, I mean, obviously, a potential overestimation of your, of your exposure, if the consequences further down the line could be that you have regulatory consequences. Um, so yeah, I think the incentives question is very interesting. And um, is, is, um, I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts on this as well. And, and I, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on the demand for introducing mandatory uh, disclosure across the board. Um, so I am among those who does not think that disclosure by itself will, will do the job. I mean, we need much more. We need industrial policies. We need, we'll need uh, um, a lot of different uh, action in financial governance. Um, but I would argue that Disclosure is one important element, it's only one element, uh, but we need mandatory disclosure for all financial institutions and also all uh, listed companies uh, and also all, all uh, larger companies um, to provide a basis for, for um, further analysis. And again, I don't think it, you know, it's sufficient, but, but would you agree that it, 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 is, uh, it is necessary? Absolutely. But I think, as you say, it should be appreciated as one tool within um, a broader ecosystem of measures that um, kind of, uh, you know, guides companies towards a more sustainable way of doing business. And I think one of the great things about disclosure is actually, and one of the, the many advantages of the TCFD and now the TNFD, is that, that for the first time they're getting some companies in some sectors to actually think about these issues um, in an analytical sense. And even if quantitatively it may not be possible to generate particularly meaningful estimations resulting from, you know, um, precise measurements, the, the qualitative process of thinking through how your um, business model is exposed to or is impacting uh, certain environmental um, problems is obviously um, a very useful exercise and definitely one to be um, applauded. And I think they've made great progress in terms of getting that up on people's agendas in the corporate world. Yeah, very much agree. Um, so there's a question from uh, Ikealo, who's asking about uh, central banks in the global south, for example, in Africa, um, that have to tackle climate change and have sustainable green growth. Um, what, what, what should they be doing or should they rely on the goodwill of the global north to sort climate change? This is coming back to that the justice question again, um, again, a really good question. Um, I think the, the, the central banks in emerging economies actually present a really interesting case study here because um, they very often have um, very different mandates to advanced economies in that there's often a lot more coordination already existing between um, fiscal and industrial policy and on, on monetary policy and particularly coordination also with, um, with national development banks where they exist. So um, there has been some work done on this um, by my colleague Josh Ryan Collins and also um, Simon Dickow at the LSE Grantham Institute on the ways that some emerging economy central banks um, are actually using their regulatory toolkit already um, to uh, green uh, macro prudential policy, for example and also um, to sort of steer credit towards and away from um, certain industries. So, you know, I would put it the other way around. I think that the global North has got lessons to learn from um, some countries in the global South that are already putting in place actively um, some of the, uh, the potentially green uh, macro prudential policies, green monetary policies, um, which, we're, which I've been talking about today. And Ikealo, being on my green finance course, <laughs> we'll hear much more about that in the coming weeks. Gregor. Yeah, I would perhaps add a couple of words here um, uh, to the uh, interesting question by Ikealo, um, which, I mean, it sounds to me a little bit like, you know, we're drifting into this tail wag the dog perspective. I mean, I think we have to also remember that financial markets cannot and central banks cannot tackle climate change by themselves. And um, I just wanted to go back to this global um, public goods problem, 
uh, if, if that is really what we're worried about, then all we would need, according to a standard, um, um, you know, mainstream economics perspective, is actually a right price for providing, um, oh, you know, for polluting uh, the commons that thereby uh, take away the public good or do not provide it sufficiently, which can be done entirely without financial markets. And so the only problem for financial markets then would be to respond to these prices. But without the prices, I mean, again, as a financial actor, you're not punished, right, for, um, for engaging in, in, in making a profit in the existing um, price system. Of course, all, all that then may lead ultimately to uh, a collapse of the whole system because, you know, maybe the climate becomes uninhabitable to most, uh, to, to humans in, in, some, in many places. Um, or water will rise and you know, all coastal cities will go away. But um, I think like, you know, as long as these kind of prices aren't in place, it, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to expect that from the financial sector to tackle this. And so in that sense, um, yeah, I mean, global north, global south um, certainly hang together for all of these global goods that, that somehow have to be protected. But um, and of course, the financial sector could ideally be um, leading the way in some of these aspects. I'm just not so hopeful that, you know, as long as you, you are incentivized to make profits from um, certain activities, it is part of that profit making machine that, that can somehow tackle the whole problem by itself. I would, I would take a somewhat more uh, optimistic approach. Um, and so central banks and, and supervision, you know, can be, central banking supervision can be extremely powerful. And um, uh, if central banks use their power and also supervisors, uh, they can make a huge difference. Uh, so as um, uh, Katie pointed out, um, they actually have a big market shaping power. Yeah? So uh, markets uh, develop over time and, and um, uh, central banks have historically played a very important role in developing certain markets. Um, and they, they certainly can continue doing so. So um, uh, maybe that's not, 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 not the greatest example ever, but in, in the green finance space, um, uh, central banks and, and other public financial institutions have been instrumental in developing the green bond market. Now, the green bond market is not going to solve all our problems, but um, they can help um, uh, rewire uh, finance. And uh, so very concretely, what, what central banks uh, in uh, developing countries can do, well, they can help um, foster um, long-term or kind of uh, capital markets for, for long-term investment in, for example, climate, uh, um, uh, climate resilient infrastructure. Yeah? Um, there has been a huge discussion about uh, shifting the trillions and, and uh, you know, trying to lure capital from advanced countries into developing countries. Um, I think what is much more important is to mobilize domestic resources uh, to, to uh, invest in uh, the areas that are really needed, long-term uh, kind of uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, and so on. And uh, here, central banks can really play an important role in building these markets. Uh, they can, for example, also build an environment uh, where digital solutions, which are becoming ever more important, uh, can be used for um, uh, the sustainable investment. There's huge uh, uh, opportunity in that area, and it's really just starting uh, to happen. There's some, some exciting work going on. Um, and of course, and that is a very important uh, dimension. Um, uh, developing countries are typically much more exposed to, to physical risk. And um, many are also very heavily exposed to transition risk. Um, and uh, central banks are in a very important position to help their governments to um, analyze and mitigate these macro financial risks. And, and um, uh, so I think that, that actually a lot that they can can do uh, to address these climate issues, but this would really uh, warrant another uh, seminar. Um, 
And uh, I know we, we are having just two minutes uh, left, and I would just like to give these two minutes uh, to Katie to, to, to give us some, some final uh, thoughts. And I, I think we, we should have at least another half hour. But anyway, uh, Katie, two minutes for some final thoughts. Sure. Um, so thank you everyone for your great questions and um, your uh, great comments, Ulrich and, and Gregor. I've really enjoyed that discussion. I guess I, I have three takeaways really in terms of where, where we go from here. Um, I'm aware that the uh, agenda I outlined in my talk is obviously um, very conceptual, um, sort of very uh, talking about level of, uh, the, um, theoretical implications at quite a high level, but I do think there are practical steps that um, need to be taken by financial authorities now um, in order to, um, you know, increase their institutional capacity in understanding um, the, the interactions between, between finance and environmental breakdown. And, and uh, as a first takeaway, I think they should be wary of considering environmental risks in isolated silos. We're already seeing, you know, this trend towards dealing with climate on one hand and then biodiversity on another. And then, you know, what next? Do we look at water and soil also in isolation? No, I think really nature related financial risks need to be appreciated as the multiple interconnected threats that they are, which and they, the fact they also interact with climate change. So there needs to be from the start a, a holistic way of approaching these um, these types of environmental threats. Secondly, I think this concept of double materiality and the potential endogeneity of, of nature related financial risk um, needs to be much more explicitly recognized as, as dynamics of, of, rec of relevance to financial authorities, particularly financial and supervisors. And that means, you know, giving the impacts of finance just as much weight as um, risk exposures. And finally, um, you know, coming back to this idea of the precautionary principle. I think from the start, yes, I recognize that there does need to be some level of research and information building and capacity building, but financial authorities need to acknowledge that the bar of certainty that they may need to justify to put in place regulatory interventions uh, may need to be far lower when they're dealing with these radically uncertain threats. Um, so, you know, it would be great to see that emerging research agenda focus on some of the qualitative methods that I spoke about, you know, adaptive policy design, sensitive intervention points. These are the, some of the relevant concepts that I think it would be great to see financial authorities um, focusing on as they, as they build their research agendas in this area. So, yeah, so that's it from me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, I, I should maybe add that the reason why I'm really... I tend to be on the more optimistic side is that uh, I've, I've been in this conversation for a good decade and uh, the conversation has changed so dramatically. Um, and uh, it's not that everyone is, is fully uh, on board with the ideas that Katie, for example, has put forward uh, tonight, but um, there really is a lot happening now. And, and I, I do see that this is really a moment of change. And um, so I am, mildly optimistic that we will be moving in the right direction, not at the speed uh, that we need to be going, but um, I, I think we are going to see major changes in the central banking space. And uh, so discussions like the, the ones we're having today uh, will certainly have to continue. Uh, so thank you very, very much, Katie. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and, and uh, uh, giving your questions. Um, the last task for me is uh, not only to thank uh, Katie and Gregor uh, very much, but also to uh, point out that the next webinar in this series will be in two weeks time on 27th of January. And it will be on the elusive quest for structural transformation Africa, will China make a difference by Alimayu Gida from Addis Ababa University. So uh, please switch in. Uh, for that one and thanks everyone and uh, stay safe and bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.